What if I told you that in the middle of some of the driest deserts in China, millions of fish swim, grow, and are harvested? It sounds impossible, right? Well, it's real. And it's one of the most surprising agricultural experiments of the decade. Recently, China began a quiet revolution, one that doesn't involve building cities or roads, but growing fish in the heart of the desert. Yes, fish. This project is already going on in regions like Xinjiang and Gansu, where lots of desert land is being used as testing grounds for aquaculture innovation. In areas once seen as too arid for crops, scientists and farmers raise salmon, trout, and sturgeon. And the motivation isn't novelty. China faces pressure to improve food security, boost rural economies, and restore degraded land. Now, what happens when you introduce millions of fish into artificial ponds in one of the harshest landscapes on Earth and wait a year. Our story begins in a few of China's most unlikely regions. Jiemo County in Xinjiang and parts of Gansu province, that's near the vast Kumtag and Taklamakan deserts. Now, these places are remote, but they're also some of the driest and most unforgiving environments in all of Asia. There's barely any rain, temperatures go from scorching hot to insanely cold, and the soil? Well, it's salty and brittle. Suffice it to say, you wouldn't expect any typical crops to grow there. For many years, this land was written off. Everyone looked at it like a lost cause, and frankly, I would too. A degraded land that's too dry and too far away from any major agricultural zones. But as China's population continued to grow, the strain on farms grew. The Chinese had to find new sources to get food, and fast. Then something unexpected happened. Instead of paving over the land, or abandoning it forever, some experts asked a different question. What if the desert could work with us and not against us? So the idea of desert aquaculture was born. At first, people thought the idea a bit too ambitious, but thanks to geological surveys, researchers found something surprising. There were shallow, saline alkaline water tables that lay just beneath the desert floor. Together with meltwater from distant mountains and smart water delivery systems, this made fish farming, at least in theory, possible. Soon after, experimental sites were set up in counties with low populations across Gansu and Xinjiang. Some started with a few artificial ponds, others expanded quickly because early results came in. And the most important thing is that a large number of these projects were developed on land that was already degraded or marginal land. Simply put, no valuable farms got lost. It's incredible how, little by little, the landscape changed. Where there was only sand and emptiness, bright blue fish ponds appeared like magic. Well, they didn't actually pop out of thin air, but you get the point. As time passed, some techniques became better to deal with extreme conditions, and also factors like temperature control and the careful balancing of water salinity. Moreover, native and salt-tolerant fish species were brought in, and they raised the success rates even higher. Now, from here, things only got more ambitious. At first, the whole project seemed absurd. Fish need water, right? And deserts are deserts because they lack water. So how do these deserts become fish farms? First, researchers found a hidden resource. Under the sand, there are saline alkaline groundwater reserves. In regions like Xinjiang, this water is surprisingly similar to seawater in its composition. Aquaculture experts now know how to treat and adjust it using a combination of filtration, mineral balancing, and careful dilution. They added trace minerals and filtered the water so it supported healthy growth in species like shrimp, grouper, and tilapia. In addition, meltwater from the Tian Shan Mountains is another water source, so glaciers thaw seasonally, and as they thaw, they feed rivers and reservoirs downstream. This meltwater gets channeled through various methods directly into the fish farms. This freshwater is pretty important. It's not just a source of water, but it's also used to dilute how saline the groundwater is. Thereby, it stops the environment from getting too harsh to support aquatic life. Then, with these two water sources, filtered saline groundwater and glacier-fed meltwater, farms create a stable and regulated aquatic environment. However, maintaining these conditions over time needs modern infrastructure. 
Each pond comes with oxygenators, automated feeders, temperature regulators, and water quality sensors. These tools give fish the best conditions because they adjust the salinity, oxygen levels, and temperature in real time. In addition, biosecurity measures are taken very seriously. Entry points are always disinfected, and strict water monitoring stops diseases from breaking out. It's pretty cool because it lets farms keep healthy stock without having to depend heavily on chemicals for treatments. Furthermore, many operations utilize Recirculating Aquaculture Systems RAS. RAS is a closed-loop design which continuously filters, sterilizes, and reuses the same water, so the overall consumption reduces like crazy, which lets fish be raised well even in one of the driest environments on Earth. Plus, there are loads of energy-efficient technologies like solar-powered pumps and smart monitoring systems. These technologies further lower the ecological footprint. Now, I must say, many of these farms are strategically built on degraded farmland or saline alkali wasteland. Consequently, there's less disruption to natural ecosystems or productive agricultural zones. See, we have to remember that sustainability is a central focus, too. There are a few promotional claims talking about zero antibiotics, zero emissions, and zero pollution. They operate with low manpower requirements while maintaining high productivity. That's truly impressive. We can see that with these methods, desert aquaculture is also environmentally conscious. It's a bit surprising how these desert aquaculture projects aren't just existing, they're producing, too. But wait. What are they producing? In places like Jingtai County in Gansu Province, entire desert landscapes transformed into amazing aquaculture centers, and they stretch over thousands of hectares. Now, they aren't just pilot programs or test ponds, they're full-scale, full-scale commercial fish farms operating in some of the harshest locations China has to offer. Instead of focusing on species with low value, these farms produce some of the most commercially valuable aquatic animals in the world. Desert fish farms successfully raised species that are usually found in clean, cold, or coastal waters, namely cold water fish like trout and salmon. There are also marine species like grouper and even shrimp, species that we thought would never survive in an inland desert environment that are now calling these controlled desert ponds home. In some farms across Xinjiang, for example, loads of fish were released into newly constructed ponds. Within just a few months, they showed rapid growth under stable temperature and feeding conditions. In other words, they basically grew like crazy. This kind of sped up. Development is possible because of the tightly regulated water environments, optimized feeding systems, and the fact that there aren't any predators or seasonal temperature shocks. Moreover, the scale of production just keeps growing. In areas that, not long ago, were nothing more than dry sand and scrub, some facilities now report yearly outputs of over 300 tons of rainbow trout alone. Others produce warm water species like shrimp and grouper at levels quite comparable to traditional coastal farms. Extra infrastructure, like cold chain logistics, on-site processing centers, and advanced monitoring stations also propel productivity and efficiency. While most of the production serves local and regional markets, desert-produced fish aren't limited to the country's borders. In fact, select farms have begun limited export to countries in Southeast Asia and even parts of Europe. They're also increasingly part of China's broader export strategy. For instance, Xinjiang's trout farmers now export to foreign markets with 10% of their products sold in Singapore, Malaysia, and even the European Union. In Ili Prefecture, rainbow trout farming has become a 100 million yuan industry. And there are plans to accelerate production even more as the years go by. These successes didn't just pass by. Agricultural officials across western China are increasingly supporting the expansion of desert aquaculture zones. And it isn't just because of their productivity, but because these projects show that even non-arable wastelands can become engines of economic growth, food security, and rural revitalization. In short, the desert is no longer empty. It's teeming with life. Not just any life, but premium seafood, once impossible to raise in such a place. 
So what happened after a full year? Well, the transformation was truly astonishing. In regions dismissed as barren and lifeless, desert aquaculture farms started delivering tons of high-quality seafood. And they weren't just one-off cases. Across multiple counties in Xinjiang and Gansu, these projects grew very fast from test trials to fully operational commercial ventures. Some farms in Xinjiang even reported producing between 260 to 300 tons of salmon every season, while others harvested over 150 tons of sturgeon. It's prized not only for its meat, but for the potential of future caviar production. In Ukturpan County alone, one facility generated close to 20 million yuan in annual revenue. Kind of crazy that all this came from land that was once considered agriculturally useless. Meanwhile, in Gansu's Jingtai County, where saline alkaline land was once unproductive, fish and shrimp farms turned over 10,867 hectares of desert edge land into productive ponds. In 2023, they yielded 2.12 million kilograms of seafood, and it was valued at more than 60 million yuan. It also helped reduce soil salinization in surrounding fields thanks to reuse of nutrient-rich wastewater for crop irrigation. But the benefits weren't just economic. As the fish ponds expanded, the land itself began to recover. The moisture of the soil increased, vegetation returned, and local microclimates cooled slightly too. In some areas, the advance of desertification slowed tremendously, which switched environmental damage into ecological restoration. It's equally important to note that these systems are closely monitored by research teams. These teams use sensors, drones, and AI models to track how the fish grow, their feed efficiency, and also water quality in real time. The integration of data analytics enables early detection of issues like disease or imbalances in salinity. All this makes the farm management more adaptive and resilient. Their findings are being compiled into regional aquaculture guidelines and support replication in other arid provinces, including Inner Mongolia, Ningxia, and parts of Qinghai. Moreover, partnerships with universities and agricultural research institutions give room for innovations in low salinity breeding programs. They also allow sustainable feed alternatives and biosecurity protocols that potentially work in desert ecosystems. Importantly, these farms also bring new employment opportunities. Villagers transition from seasonal labor or subsidies to stable careers. Their new careers make them manage fish health, maintain ponds, and oversee water systems. Training programs also give the locals new technical skills, and that creates a new generation of aquaculture technicians and managers. As a result, local incomes get higher, migration gets lower, and desert communities show more and more signs of sustainable growth. But let's look beyond the desert. This movement isn't just about feeding a few local communities in the remote corners of Xinjiang and Gansu. The degree with which desert aquaculture is growing keeps increasing, and so does its reach. In fact, a lot of the seafood raised in these unlikely environments is already being transported to major urban centers across China, some of which are Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou. In some cases, shipments even find their way into international markets, where Chinese-grown salmon and sturgeon quietly gain more and more recognition for their quality and sustainability. What began as a bold agricultural experiment is being woven into the fabric of China's national food strategy. It's a long-term plan to boost domestic production, reduce dependence on imports, and manage natural resources better. Plus, in a country with more than 1.4 billion mouths to feed, innovation of this scale and ambition isn't a small feat. Furthermore, desert aquaculture aligns closely with China's broader dual circulation policy. That policy emphasizes self-reliance in key sectors while it stays globally competitive. When the strain on traditional fisheries and coastal ecosystems gets weaker, fish farms in the country make national supply chains stronger. These desert farms are a new frontier, one where food production doesn't depend on fertile valleys or coastlines, but instead emerges from terrains once seen as inhospitable. Already, logistics networks have upgraded to be able to effectively transport live or freshly processed fish to distant markets in record time. This keeps them fresh, and it also reduces waste. Cold chain infrastructure, once limited to coastal regions, is also extending into the western provinces. 
Additionally, the government plays a part, too. They provide support with stuff like targeted subsidies, research grants, and land use policy reforms. All this makes it easier for local cooperatives and private firms to grow their fish farms more and more. These incentives make people want to go into fish farming. Plus, they help to recreate successful models in new locations across various places globally. They show us and the world how science, infrastructure, and local cooperation rewrites what's possible in food security. In doing so, China isn't just feeding more people, it's transforming how and where food gets produced. Of course, transforming deserts into fish farms is definitely not easy. In the beginning, construction itself was a massive hurdle to jump over. In one Xinjiang project, some excavators sank into shifting sand, and roads had to be built first just to access the remote site. Unfortunately, that delayed the project by years. Then before infrastructure was even complete, flash floods wiped out 600,000 fish. The floods also damaged canals and destroyed roads, forcing the team to rebuild with dams and diversion systems to manage seasonal water surges. Meanwhile, sandstorms posed a consistent threat. In lots of facilities, desert dust buried buildings and pipes that repeatedly disrupted operations. As a result, windbreaks, vegetation belts, and canal systems got integrated into farm design to reduce sand damage and lessen the risks in the future. Next comes the challenge of water. Although saline alkaline groundwater and glacial meltwater make desert aquaculture possible, they have to be managed ruthlessly. In Xinjiang, for instance, agriculture already uses more than 90% of the regional water. That contributes to groundwater depletion and worsens scarcity in the long term. Climate models warn that melting glaciers, which supply part of the farm's fresh water, may decline within decades. It's sad how that threatens all desert water projects. And we're not done. Infrastructure costs are another significant constraint. Designing ponds with specialized linings, installing kilometers of pipelines, deploying oxygenators, and integrating automated monitoring systems don't come cheap. Plus, all these structures need maintenance consistently, especially when there's constant sand infiltration. Even then, desert climates keep challenging the farm managers. Extreme temperatures from scorching 40 degrees Celsius during the day to freezing temperatures at night stress the fish. So their oxygen, salinity, and temperature always has to be monitored to make them stay alive. It's quite a task. In short, desert aquaculture needs relentless attention, and if even one of these issues doesn't get addressed, an entire operation possibly falls apart. Yet despite the costs and risks, these early projects still succeed. So we see that, while it's harsh, the desert can be tamed with engineering, careful management, and adaptation. In 2023, Gansu's Jingtai County emerged as a national model for inland aquaculture development, using over 10,000 hectares of previously saline alkali desert fringe Fish farms there produced more than 2.12 million kilograms of seafood, valued at over 60 million yuan. The success of these farms wasn't limited to economic impact. According to regional agricultural reports, nutrient-rich wastewater from aquaculture was reused to irrigate nearby fields, helping reduce soil salinity and restore fertility in previously degraded lands. In Uktarpan County, Xinjiang, trout and sturgeon farming generated close to 20 million yuan in revenue, with select operations exporting fish to Southeast Asia. These projects also catalyzed local employment shifts, with hundreds of rural residents transitioning from seasonal labor to full-time aquaculture management roles. The Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs has since identified these models as replicable, launching similar programs in Ningxia, Qinghai, and Inner Mongolia, further expanding China's desert aquaculture footprint. A few years ago, these deserts were seen as dead land. Today, they're full of life. Fish farms in the desert sound like science fiction, but in China, they are a science reality. And the results? Well, they're absolutely incredible. What do you think about fish farming in China? Leave your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more info like this.